So, good morning, my name is Benoît Lisso. I am a biologist working in Paris, area in France, and I'm going to speak about today about the rapid hemicellular panels and viral encephalitis, and so a little bit of meningitis, which use of this kind of test and for which patients. So, a quick word about my disclosure first. Uh, I worked for Biomary Fire and also for Stag Dynasty Acquisition. Uh, about my hospital environment, I'm working in an hospital in Paris area, in an hospital group, encompassing five different hospitals, uh, all in the northern area of Paris. I want also to acknowledge Dr. Nadira Uhu, which helped me a lot to construct these slides about these syndromes. So a quick word about encephalitis first. Uh, encephalitis is a disease with high morbidity. Um, mortality is between 9 and 12 percent and you have persistence of CKLA for 40 percent of the patients three years after the acute infection. 24 percent of the patients cannot return to work. So all these encephalitis are, have the highest cost for the society for hospitalization, treatments, CKLA and productivity, productivity loss. The epidemiology the incidence is estimated between 1 to 7 cases per 100,000 inhabitants in per year in France, and the etiology is identified in only 30 to 52% of cases. There is a high diversity of etiological agents, and so there is an imperative use of a large variety of microbiological expertise and techniques, techniques to test everything. The main pathogens are mostly herpes simplex viruses, 1 and 2, but also varicella, enteroviruses, mycobacterium tuberculosis in specific settings, or tick-borne encephalitis, and a lot of other pathogens possible. Flu, HHV6, EBV, measles, listeria. If you have a traveler patient, vector diseases, Zika, West Nile, Japanese encephalitis, and so on. Or for immunocompromised patients, you also have to check HIV, GC, CMV, EBV, toxoplasmosis, and so on. If you are looking about the clinical signs, you have vigilance or disorder, behavioral disorders, epileptic seizures, focal neurological signs, and fever. There are no. <coughs> so you have to perform a huge variety of sampling, and if you are looking for the French recommendation, you have to perform some blood sampling for hemocultures, blood cell counts, electrolytes, glycemia at the time of the lumbar puncture, CRP, hepatitic markers, hemostasis, CPK, and so on. You also have to perform a lumbar puncture with a sufficient volume for biochemistry, glucose, proteins, proteins lactates, bacteriology, cytology, cell count, and if you have more than four, five, 10 leukocytes, depending on the settings, gram stains, and bacteriological culture. Regarding virology, you have to perform at least a PCR for HSV, VZV, enteroviruses, and sometimes some other viruses. The recommendation also says that you have to provide an etiological diagnosis as soon as possible, the sooner the better, and it should be before 48 hours. But this is quite complex. So, what, what you have to do when you are looking for what, which kind of exam to choose, you have a group of core exams. For example, in the, in the CSF, you have to perform PCR for at least HSV, VZV, sometimes other viruses, but you also can perform serology for these viruses and check for some other viruses that you can find for every kind of patients. If you have an immunocompromised patient, you have to have GC, CMV, BV, HIV, toxoplasmosis. And if you are looking for travelers, well, depending on the area of travel, you have to a lot of pathogen to search for by PCR or serology, tuberculosis in some context. So there is a lot of difficulties with all these recommendations and all these pathogens, pathogens to search for. The first problem is the low sensitivity of ground stain. Another one is also the low time, the longer, long time to have a result for culture, 24 to 88 hours, PCR, and even, it's even longer, 
for specialized analysis, which you have to send to some external centers. You also have a huge requirement for high cyberspiral fluid volumes, which is complex to obtain and pose several problems. The first one is a CSF stock for second cell use. You have to keep the, you have to test your first line uh, metogen, keep some CSF somewhere in the lab or in the clinical unit with different problems. If you keep it in the lab, you have a good conditions for the conservation of the samples. But if you keep it in the clinical unit, you can have a quicker reaction time for performing this second analysis according to both the first results that you obtain from the biological units and also for the clinical data that you have for the follow-up of your patient. And whatever you do, you have still a very limited volume of CSF available. So this pose several problems. The first one about the long time to results, it conduct to delayed therapeutic decision with frequent complication, impact on duration of hospitalization, impact on complementary, complementary testing, often not useful and costly. And you also have a useless prescription of probabilistic antibiotherapy and acyclovir. About the high uh, cerebrospinal fluid volumes, it's almost impossible to have sufficient volume for testing all the second line pathogens possible. It's even worse for the third line pathogens. So you have to choose which pathogen to test each time. In this context, uh, you have now access to the film array panel, for example, the ME panel, which can provide a detection of all HSV viruses, enteroviruses, paracoviruses, VZV, CNV, HSV6, but also six bacteria, E. coli, Hemophilus influenzae, Listeria monostogenes, Nesaya mengitidis, Streptococcus agalactiae, or Streptococcus pneumoniae, and you also can detect Cryptococcus neoferments. All these pathogens can be, can, can be done at once with a low sample volume of 200 microliters, and you have a mean time to results below, in our settings in my hospital, three hours. So just a quick overview of the process of this test. There is only a few analytical steps, which takes less than three minutes to a technician. And then you have the extraction, amplification, and detection uh, steps, which are all done in the same uh, cartridge or pouch, depending on the way, you, the, the way you want to describe it. All these tests are performed at once, and it takes one hour. So in one hour and a few minutes in your lab, you can have all the results for all these pathogens at once. So this changed a lot of things in your, in your settings, in your global settings about the sampling, the samples that you have performed during the number structure. You still have to send a sample to the biochemistry lab for proteins, glucose, and lactates. Another sample to the bacteriology lab for the gram stain, cytology, pneumococcus antigen, if needed, and the bacterial culture. And sometimes you can send a second CSF sample in the bacteriology lab for the PCR for the CM and GTDs, for example, or Staphylococcus pneumoniae. And then if you think about, if you have to exclude a uh, viral encephalitis or viruses, you'd send another sample to the virology lab for the PCR for HSV, VZV, or enteroviruses. All these tests takes between a few hours for the quicker of them and a few days for the, other, for the longer of them. And you also have to keep in mind, that in some particular settings, you have to screen for toxoplasmosis, cryptococcus, HIV, armoviruses, autoimmunity, tuberculosis, and so on. So in this context, where to send the samples and what to do with it, the, main, the film ME panel changed some things, because as you can see here, it can allow to perform all these tests and a few other PCR that are not usually done, and the cryptococcus performance also, in, with only one tube, and in a very quick delay, because it takes you only a few hours for all of them. So you can, ask, you can speed up the etiological diagnosis and have some answers three days earlier with an enlarged etiological diagnosis, and this can be available 24 7. So this test is full of promises about the speed of the process and the, some economy about the CSF volume. But before to use it, what are the performances of this test? 
the first study was conducted in the Paris, in Paris hospitals. It was a retrospective, retrospective study conducted on frozen CSF, and the results were compared with conventional results obtained by Gram, Culture, PCR, and so on. The, this test achieved a very good sensitivity for viral targets of 100%, with two exceptions, CMV and HHV6, because of low viral loads, which were below the fumarate detection cutoff. For bacteriological targets, all were detected. Just a word about Listeria, which was not, not tested in this study. And for Cryptococcus, in diagnosis condition, all were detected. You still have to keep in mind that if you treat the Cryptococcus infections, the PCR becomes very quickly negative. But for diagnosis, 100% of them were detected. So this test achieved a very good sensitivity at about 90% and the 10% missing are, about, are this CMV and this HHV6 below the cutoff value and a very good, very good specificity, more than 99%. The, a, a huge prospective study has also been conducted in the US with more than 1,500 CSFs and it achieved also a very good sensitivity with a very, very few targets missed. Listeria and meningococcus were not tested in this study also, and also achieved, it also achieved a very, very good specificity. In my hospital, we wanted to verify all these performances in real condition, and for nine months, we tested in parallel all the CSF received in the Varigical lab with the ME panel and the usual, the usual test requested at the beginning by the physician. So you have the list of all the tests, the usual tests of the virology lab, bacteriology lab, and parasitology lab that were used uh, on request. More than 500 CSF have been tested, and we have a positive CSF results for 9% of these CSFs. This is not a lot, but this is, this is very different according to the unit. For the emergency unit, we had more than 12% of positive results, and for the pediatrical unit, more than 25 percent. We looked for the concordance of the results of the ME panel on the usual techniques for viruses and the concordance was pretty good at more than 98 percent. There was a very few number of discrepancies that I am going to discuss uh, in the next slide. For the bacteria uh, part, we had six positive results with the ME panel from Belfair de Marieux. Two were confirmed by Gramstein or Culture. One was a Nessaya meningitidis and one other was a Stratococcus algalactiae. Four positive results with the ME panel were not confirmed by the usual test. For one of these patients, this was bacterial meningitidis, even if the pathogenic agent had not been found with the usual essay, and it was a Stratococcus algalactiae. For those three other uh, positive results, this was not associated to any bacteria managed this at all. So you have to keep this in mind. The specificity is very good, but as bacteria managed this are also very rare, the predictive positive value is not of 100%. And you have to check all the clinical and biological value at the time of the results to verify if this pathogenic agent can be retained or not. This is not so difficult in the real life. All the Results, positive results with the patients that are not in bacterial meningitis were pretty clear since the beginning. You just have to keep this in mind and to discuss with the physician about the thoracic results. For cryptococcus, we have also the same kind of uh, problems. We have only one positive result with the ME panel, which was not confirmed by the usual method and was not a meningitis associated with cryptococcus. So for bacteria on cryptococcus, the good part of this test is that it, ne it never missed anything in this study, but also in our experience since then, so one year and a half. But you have some false positive that you have to interpret carefully with the vision. About the viral discrepancies, uh, all of them are depicted here. You can see that one H herpes simplex virus 1 was found by a FIMARI panel, but not by the standard essay. And in this case, the encephalitis was retained by the, by the physicians and the patient was treated with acyclovir. 
because clinically it was an uh, encephalitis. One VZV was not identified by the fMRI, but identified by the usual essay. It was a very low viral load with a CT value at 49. This is the case was retained as a clinical encephalitis and treated by acyclovir. Uh, to note, the patient also had an ophthalmic zoster a few days before the lumbar puncture. Another VZV was found by the fMRI, but not by the usual essay. And it was a children with a clinical varicella one month before the lumbar puncture, and it's quite it's not unusual to have varicella uh, staying in your CSF for weeks after varicella. Uh, one CMV was found by the fMRI, but not was the standard essay, and this was a purulent meningitis not associated with a viral uh, clinical picture. An enterovirus was missed but found in the stools for both SS, FIMARI and standard. So the standard value, uh, standard essay showed that the value was 35 CT. So it just, this time it, it, it seems to be a problem of uh, sensitivity maybe. And so I already talked about the four positive bacteria, I FIMARI, but not notified with the standard essay. And for the cryptococcus nerfamans, it's also important to note that one, uh, Cryptococcus was missed, kind of, by the fMRI, but it, it, it was explained by because the patient was treated since one month for the cryptococcus, and that's why the PCR assay was negative. So, just to have a quick overview of all these discrepancies regarding the virology, most of them, if not all, are fully explained, and it's not a big deal to us. Only this enteroviruses was missed with a CT value of 35. It's only one. Uh, for more than 500 essays. For the bacteria and the cryptococcus, you still have to keep in mind to discuss the results. If you don't miss anything, you have to interpret smartly the positive results. Another data is what, what I think is one of the most important added value of this panel. So we have here all the results that were obtained by the usual essay on the FIMARI ME panel. And you can see that the, for antiviruses, we found a lot of enteroviruses with the ME panel that were not found by, were not identified by usual essays. This is just because they were not tested. They were not requested by the physicians. And when the ME panel was positive with the biofire testing, we didn't have any CSF left to confirm it with the usual essays. So I think the best value of this test, you, one of the best uh, added value is that you test everything and in sometimes some things that are not requested. For example, enteroviruses are not often requested in our experience in my hospital for adult populations, but there is still a lot of them in these populations. So now physicians are aware of that and they are requesting that more frequently. In some cases, I did, this, this was outside this study, but we also had a patient with an herpes encephalitis, which was missed at the beginning by the physicians, and this kind of panel can still get them. Recently, we also have a cryptococcal meningitis that was identified by the ME panel, but was not requested at the beginning by the physicians, and then you accept, you spill the etiological diagnosis for a few days. So that's still something. So the ME thyroid panel allows you to detect a lot of pathogens at once, quickly. This is very useful. This can save you in a lot of situations. You still have to be aware of the pos possibility of false positive results and interpret your results as all logical uh, tests. And now, how you can organize your lab around this test because this changes a lot of things in the lab. Here you have a table with all the added value of this kind of panel in the lab. As you can see, there is less technical steps, more than three for usual methods, for usual PCR methods and only one for the FIMARI panel. You have less technical time, more than six hours for the usual methods, only one hour for the ME panel. You have less kits, more than three versus one, less uh, quality control. The risk of contamination is still there, but it's greatly decreased. You have less machine, less maintenance, and it's very e easy to use, so you can use it in a specialized lab, but also in all the other labs, and especially the emergency lab, to make this test available 24-7. 
There is also the added value for the physicians, a low sample volume, and you have more volumes left for some other essays, for, for the second line or the third line of your liturgical analysis. The time to result is very quick, and you have an increased number of tested targets. What about the reagent cost? So, the pricing of this test, of this ME panel from Biofire, is 140 euros in my hospital. If you add all the cost of all the reagents that you can spare with this test, uh, for so PCR for HSV1, HSV2, VZV, CMV, enteroviruses, HHV6, but also for the bacteriological lab identification, identification by Malditov, pneumococcus antigen, PCR for meningococcus or pneumococcus, and also for the paradeterical lab, direct exam, culture, and blood antigen for the cryptococcus performance. All of this can be spared, and the cost of all these tests is about is a little more than 200 euros. So the, the cost of the ME panel is lower than the cost of all the assays that you can spare. This is a, this is a little bit cheaty, I cheat a little bit with these numbers, because usually you don't do everything for every single patient. So globally, the cost is about the same in my hospital. Um, in some settings, there is a huge discussion of using a cutoff value for pleocytosis to trigger or not an ME panel quickly. So I can show you here a results that, uh, study that have been conducted uh, in the Lyme Hospital in Paris by Gauthier, Péan de Pomphilie and Hervé Jacquier. Their objective was to identify a uh, the best leukocytes cutoff value to decide to trigger or not the ME panel. So they took retrospectively all the CSFs that have been received in their hospital for three years. During these three years, they received more than 5,000 CSF and only on 4,800 were below 10 leukocytes. So the question was, is it useful or not to test this kind of CSF? They looked for all the pathogens and took a cutoff value at 20 leukocytes. F. And uh, you can see here all the results that they, they had for the bacteria pathogens, viruses pathogen, and cryptococcus nymphomans. With this 20 leukocyte cutoff value, nine, 18 on the ni and 19 bacteria were correctly identified. For viruses, 143 were had more 20 leukocytes in the CSF and only 8 were below 10, 20 leukocytes. So it worked pretty well for bacteria and viruses. For the fungi, the cocus performance, 4 were below 20 leukocytes and 5 had more than 20 leukocytes. So it's worked not so well for cryptococcus performance. There is a good reason for that. These patients are mostly even, are only immunocompromised patients. So for immunocompromised patients, this kind of cutoff is definitely, definitely not a good idea. Whatever, in this retrospective study, they can perform only 460 ME panel instead of more than 5,000, and they can achieve a 36% of positivity rate. So the use of this kind of leukocyte cutoff value to trigger a test is a usual way of thinking for all bacteriologists. And I'm not saying that, it is, that it, this is a stupid one, but I am a virologist and I don't like it so much because it's not working pretty well for viruses, especially for, for viral encephalitis. So here you have all the CSF with the positive viral detection that we had in my hospital in the same period of time. And you can see, for example, that for HSV1, which is definitely the one to, that must not be missed never, 30% uh, of them were below 10 leukocytes. So in three cases, only three cases, but still three cases. And in the Lyme body hospital, they only had one HSV1. It was also below 10 leukocytes. For herpes simplex virus 2, 17% of them are below 10 leukocytes. VZV, 26% of them. Enteroviruses, only 9% of them. And CNV, 75% of them, but CNV is a more complex virus to interpret. So, if you want to use 
a cutoff value with leukocytes to trigger or not uh, the ME panel. Why not? Maybe not everywhere, and definitely not, definitely not for patients for which you have a strong suspicion of viral encephalitis. Uh, also, absolutely not for patients that are immunocompromised, at least. So you have various ways of organizing organize your lab around this kind of new testing. You can use uh, you can use it for everything. That's what we have done in in my lab for all the CSF for which the physician send a sample into the virological lab we perform this kind of panel. And you can also trigger this kind of test with a leukocyte cutoff value. Be careful with that. And I think it can be better also to use not only the leukocyte value, but also all the other CSF value for proteins or glucosis to try to not miss anything because this is a danger of using this kind of uh, cutoff value. So now a quick word about, uh, about the syndromic testing in some microbiological laboratories, maybe a lot of French hospital laboratories, maybe not only in France. We are used to have uh, three separated labs, for example, one lab for bacteriology, one lab for biology, and one lab for parasitology. And here in this slide, Maybe I should draw some concrete walls between the boxes because my, in my hospital we are not even in the same building. So the communication is quite complex, even in this century. And this kind of new testing now requires this kind of organization. The physician send a sample into a global lab or a new emergency lab able to perform some sampling testing quickly and then give all the samples needed for all the specialized analyses in a bacteriological subunit, virological subunit, and so on. And I also think that in a, I don't know when, but we also need this kind of organization, and it will come, maybe quickly, or I hope at least, to use uh, this kind of ceramic testing as a point of care testing, not for all the patients, not for all the units, but I, one of the most important values of this, of this new testing is the delay of results. And the quicker you will be, the better you will be for the patients. And also to spare some you not use useful um, anti-infectious uh, drugs or some hospitalizations. So in the next future, I think that all the MPCR tests should fit with the lab environment. It must be easy to use, quick, have a high sensitivity and a high specificity, which is very important issue as you test a lot of targets at the same time. It, it has to be easily available 24-7, maybe even as a point of care testing. You have to have a well-balanced panel, and this is a real nightmare because depending on your country, of your setting, you have a very different uh, epidemiology of your uh, pathogens. It should have, it must have an acceptable cost and give, maybe I think this will be more and more useful in the future, give a quantitative information. It also should fit with the physician needs and there, for that, we still need more time and more experience to give proper recommendation and clinical algorithms uh, around this kind of testing which are not very still available today because we don't have uh, enough information still today to decide about these algorithms. All the results always have to be interpreted with a complete clinical and biological context. This is true for every single uh, test, biological test. But often, if not always, when you see this kind of panel, you think that this panel will give you all the answers at once quickly. This is not true. This panel will give you a lot of very valuable information quickly, but you still have to think about the clinical context of your patients. If you don't do it, you will have some problems at any point, at some point. And we now also should uh, assess more and more the economical, economical benefit of this kind of testing to sustain their use in the future. This is also a complex task because depending on your settings, the economic, economical benefits are always different. So thank you all for your attention. Thank you to all these people that are working with me about this kind of uh, topics in my hospital groups. 
Mm. Nej. <laughs>